Hello, folks. Welcome. We have our our panelists spotlighted, and um, we're delighted to have you all. I have this guess that there are other nurses, retired nurses, and medical professionals who are joining us as well. Um, I think it'll be a really rich discussion, and I just want to make sure people know in case they want to turn off their video or it changes uh, you know, their, their remarks in any way that we are recording this. And um, there may be press present. I don't see any press that I can identify right now. And um, CCTV asked if they could have a copy of this recording to share um, to share with the general public in Chittenden County and beyond. So um, folks want to don't have to could put a comment in the chat if they'd rather it not be featured um, in some way or you know just know that and. Um, we have our, we, we are just so grateful how many people took time out of what we know are very busy schedules to participate in this really critical discussion. We still have people coming in, so we'll give it another couple of minutes and then we'll do a more formal start that will probably be the kind of start to the, you know, piece that we give to uh, CCTV and others. And yes, I think we can make the recording available to um, everyone here as well. So yeah, that's that's a great point. Okay. Um, if while we're waiting for a few more people to roll in, people want to introduce themselves in the chat, you know, you can talk about your connection to this issue, where you live, whatever feels relevant. Um, and we'll get started in just a moment. And you know, one of our uh, panelist is incredibly busy in helping her son with homework right now. So whenever um, I'll count on my team to monitor for when she looks like she can be pinned into the um, into the interview group, panelist group. Okay. And with that, um, have we cleared have we cleared the waiting room? Are we good to go? Oh, there's someone else just came in the waiting room. Three people are in the waiting room. Okay. <laughs> We're good to go. I'll keep letting people in. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, I'm Senator Keisha Rom Hinsdale. I uh, serve in the State Senate on behalf of Chittenden County and serve on the Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs Committee, as well as the Government Operations Committee, two committees that look at workforce and uh, you know our commitment as employers, both in our businesses, our institutions, as well as uh, as a state. Um, we know we have state hospitals as well. Uh, so, you know, we have all in the legislature been paying as much attention as we can to the uh, nurse staffing crisis. And um, I, you know, I say that knowing full well that this crisis didn't just begin with the pandemic. It was certainly exacerbated by the pandemic, um, but we know that this has been an issue that we have seen coming and have not done enough about. And I wanna take some responsibility for that as well. Uh, we, we need to value the nursing profession in a way that encourages more people to enter the field. And in many ways, we have fallen down on the job. Um, as folks may know, this crisis is is being felt around the country, but in a much more acute way in Vermont. The national average uh, for hospitals facing a critical staffing shortage was 29%. Here in Vermont, it's 69%. Um, so, you know, we, I think I'm just telling folks things they already know. And I particularly want to thank the panelists who are present with us, who I know are taking time out of very busy schedules and other commitments to loved ones to talk more about these issues and illuminate them for us. And I see in the chat already, there are a lot of people who are medical professionals and providers, as well as those adjacent who try to help people with social determinants of health. So really appreciate all of you being here. Um, we are just so grateful that we have panelists from around the state who have different um, lived experiences, different perspectives they bring to the table and uh, are in slightly different professions uh, in the nursing field. Um, I wanted to give all of them the chance to introduce themselves briefly and also say a few words about what made them become nurses in the first place. Um, I'm sure that will 
illuminate along the way areas where you know they are now feeling challenged to stay committed to a field that they were once really passionate about um, because some of those barriers get in the way of experiencing nursing in the way that they had envisioned originally. Um, so I will, uh, I'll start with Teresa because I think we'll go in a different order for um, the, the question that comes after. Well, I was not expecting to be called on oh, first, <laughs> but I'm ready, always ready. Um, hi everyone, um, my name is Teresa Cahill Griffin. I have been a nurse for 31 years and five years in Vermont now. And um, what brought me to nursing? Oh, I always knew I wanted to be a nurse. And my mom, of course, many of you, I'm sure nurses, your moms are nurses, your mom's moms are nurses. Same for me as well. Um, but for me, my slant's a little bit different. I, I wouldn't say that I'm that, oh, I always wanted to take care of people kind of mantra that nurses you know, um, typically say. I always knew that I wanted a job where I would always have a job, where I had a way to support myself and I had a commitment to a career that I felt I could like, it was clear to me the path um, through, through my career. And of course, it's taken many twists and turns that I had not anticipated. And um, I came to Vermont five years ago to join the faculty at UVM, where I've been full time um, since then. But I also can't break myself away from the bedside role. So I work at the bedside at the medical center, the UVM Medical Center, um, in labor and delivery, which is my clinical specialty. And I love the synergy of, of both worlds. I love being able to teach nursing students. I love the faculty role, but I love taking care of patients too. And it's, it's, it's just in our DNA. And um, to me, it's important that I always keep that, that, that toehold um, at the bedside. Mm. So that's me. Thanks so much, Teresa. Appreciating that. Christina? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Christina Price. I am a nurse at UVM Medical Center. I'm part of our critical care float pool. So I work um, in a lot of different places. I work um, in the emergency department quite a bit, both the ICUs, um, our rapid response team, and also cardiology. Um, I have a little shorter nursing career than Teresa. I've only been a nurse for about 11 years. Um, eight, eight and a half at UVM Medical Center in this role. Um, and I feel the same way, uh, Teresa. I never said I want to take care of people. My pull to nursing was I always want to. I want to be involved in my community. I want to help my community gain access to the care that they all deserve, and I want to be part of a team that can provide that. Um, I never knew I'd end up a critical care nurse. It's just where I kind of landed after um, a senior practicum experience and. Uh, I've been doing it ever since. Um, I have, um, I've really grown to love this role and I, part of uh, I, what I love about being a nurse is that there are so many different avenues you can go down. And for me, being a float nurse has been just wonderful um, to occupy that space in my mind. I can do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And to kind of tie in the uh, aspect of community. I love seeing my patients come in through the emergency room and then I get to see them in the ICU after heart surgery and then I get to see them in the cardiology floor when they're recovering and it's just a really holistic experience for me and I'm I really love that. Um, I'm a people person and so that's kind of what keeps me doing it. Mm, thanks Christina. That's yeah cool. of course. I can I can hear it. <laughs> you know what why you love doing what you do. Uh, Courtney. To introduce yourself. My name is Courtney Cutcher Fellow. I currently live in Williston. I work at Dartmouth Hitchcock, Hitchcock Medical Center. I've primarily been a uh, medical surgical uh, step down float pool nurse for almost five years now. I'm currently working on a neurology floor. I've always known that I was going to be a nurse. I've grown up, I have a huge Italian family, and I have so many little cousins that I grew up taking care of. I love taking care of people. My dad is a 100% retired veteran and I've been his primary caretaker, um, you know, for a number of years now. And it's just something, I, it's just me in a nutshell. I just love taking care of people. Uh, for me though, when I was in high school, I, uh, I had wrong site surgery when I was going to get my wisdom teeth removed and it, 
So I myself was a patient for a really long time. And because of my amazing team of medical, of doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, they really helped change my life and put me, you know, put me on the trajectory where I am right now. So I love being able to make a, an impact on people's lives, just like they did for me. And it's such a rewarding career for me. Mm, thanks so much, Courtney. And just to make sure I understand, you said wrong side surgery. So there was a mistake made and they performed surgery on the wrong side of your, of your mouth. Where, yep. Wow. Oh my gosh. Thanks for sharing that. And yeah, I could see how that you'd want to get things right for people after that. Um, Patricia, I know you, you looked like you were able to join us. Um, are you still here? Hi, Patricia. Thanks so much for being with us. Hi, yes. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this. Um, tonight, I'm just ever so blessed and grateful to be a part of this. Um, my name is Patricia Johnson. I work as an emergency department nurse at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, Dartmouth-Hitchcock and also spoke nurse um, for an addictions um, MAT, which is Medication Assisted Treatment Center. And um, I, I'm just really grateful to be on and collaborate with all of you uh, to discuss these important matters that, you know, in situations that are arising and really they're, they're barriers to, my ability to be productive as a nurse. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Patricia. So great introductions. And, you know, it's hard not to note that it seems like, from my observation, everyone's a female identifying person as well in this group. Um, you know, women have absolutely been on the front lines of this pandemic. Um, and it's, it's in many ways as nurses and educators. Um, and you know, probably balancing being parents and you know primary caregivers as well through all of that. So once again, appreciating you all being here and recognizing that it's truly in many ways been women on the front lines. Um, you know, I think that leads into a discussion of a wide range of issues as to why we have a nursing shortage here in Vermont um, that's mirrored around the, the country, but certainly much more deepened. Here, we were going to talk about wages, uh, nurse educators, and access to nurse educators, safe staffing ratios, um, protections in the workplace, resources, staff resources, mental health resources, housing, um, so many different issues. Um, thought in the continuum of things, we'd start with, you know, the education piece. That's the really, that's the entryway into the workforce. Um, Courtney, it sounded like that's something that you wanted to start by addressing? So I think, you know, I was reading an article not that long ago. Um, it was dated January 2nd, 2022 um, from Bernie Sanders. And he was talking about how Vermont needs nine to 10,000 nurses within five to seven years. And we are currently um, graduating 500 to 600 nurses every year. So that is, you know, obviously a very critical component that we need to focus on. We're not producing enough nurses, uh, enough nurses to keep up with how many nurses we need. So one of the aspects I really wanted to discuss was, I think it's really important to make um, undergraduate nursing education more accessible and affordable in Vermont, because I know a lot of nurses who are going to school and they are graduating with crippling student loan debt and it's a lot of nurses you know it's decentivizing people to want to go to school and then work and then just be crippled in student loan debt so i think that's really important and i think it's really important for us to provide more grants and more scholarship opportunities or more student loan forgiveness opportunities for for nurses who want to become nursing educators and who want to work, you know, in universities to help increase the amount of students we're able to graduate. And I think another important aspect, which I saw in the article I just read, which I can share with everyone in this group after this, is 
I think we should look at increasing the salaries for nursing educators because there's so many different areas of nursing that nurses can go to graduate school for and education is, you know, not, it's not one of the, you know, it's not one of the more higher paying, you know, areas that you can get into. So I think that we should incentivize more educators in Vermont and, you know, produce more, you know, be able to graduate more nursing students. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks, Courtney. You're welcome. I'm going to go find that article and share it with you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that'd be great. Can I piggyback off of what Courtney's saying? Sure. Yeah. And then we'll go to Terry. Who's so, hi, my name is Patricia Johnson, and I'm actually going to take it a step further. I think that we should do loan cancellation. Um, forgiveness is unobtainable. Um, by the time that we hit the 10, 15 year mark, our loans are already paid off, especially if we're responsible and we're paying extra on our principal. Loan cancellation will allow us to start and be present from the get-go, right out of the gates. So there's always this looming feeling when you're working. It's like, I'm working to pay off my debt. I'm working to pay off my debt. I want to work to strengthen my community. I want to work to support patients. And if loan forgiveness is an option, which not very many people that I know have ever been able to succeed in, I, I mean, that's great. But loan cancellation uh, would allow us to hit hit the the ground running um, and just start out and be productive, not have any stress. We already have a lot of stress being a nurse, especially during COVID. So now, if we have loan cancellation, we're able to know that you know what, there's nothing that's holding me back. I can come to work. I can take care of my patients, I can go home, I've got my paycheck. And then it also contributes to stimulus of our actual community. If I'm not having to pay $652.52, mm -hmm. which is what I pay currently a month, then I'm able to put that back into my community. I'm able to purchase a home, purchase a car, I'm able to support local um, businesses. I'm able to enjoy time with my family. It leads less resentful feelings towards the nursing um, field. Um, I, I have to say that, you know, I've been getting super angry and feeling very um, left out, very isolated, um, very um, unsupported lately and it all boils down to that payment you know mm -hmm. like so it's the first of the month the payments due on the fifth for me right like I'm super nervous about that mm -hmm. and it causes me angst it causes me anxiety um I, you know it it affects my work ability it affects my work day it affects my workflow if I knew that I wouldn't have that payment, if I knew that I had the support of Vermont um, and that they believed in me and knew that I was doing the best I could to the best of my ability, I feel like I'd be on like cloud nine and that I would just be free to do what I wanted to do, which is the initial thing that I got into nursing for, to help people. But it's so hard to help people, other people, when I'm struggling myself, single mom, three children. I mean, that, that's a huge chunk of my paycheck. Mm. Thanks, Patricia, for, I mean, really painting a picture with a lot of honesty and bravery. So thank you. And you're not asking for a lot. So it's just really helpful. People are, you know, putting in the chat, one of the clear reasons why why we're facing such a shortage is you know that 
that uh, cost of living to wage ratio and, you know, your, um, your experience of, you know, paying off that debt when it, you know, we should be paying nurses <laughs> to, to go to school and to start in this field. Terry, and I have the- one more, I have one yeah. more thing to say. I'm so sorry. Um, I just want to note that minorities um, are, it, it's a statistic and it's a proven fact that minorities graduate with um, more student loan debt than um, anybody else. So mm-hmm. I just want to give you a figure. I do, I graduated with over $100,000 worth of student loan debt. Mm-hmm. How, how is that supposed to work? Mm-hmm. You know, how am I supposed to manage my everyday life um, and get back on track and be a productive citizen um, contributing um, legally to my community with that amount of debt. Mm. That is real, Patricia. Thank you. And, you know, to to get into that much debt to try and help people in a field that's critical just seems really wrong. Um, Tiri, you're on the faculty side of this. I imagine you have conversations about access and and trying to make these numbers different. Uh, what does that look like? So from the faculty aspect, there's so much, I mean, to piggyback on what Courtney had um, said, it, it's more than attracting people to the nurse educator role. The, the two roles don't really, they're not in synergy. If the educator role is very scripted from the university side and the regulatory side of what a college professor in, in Vermont makes and it doesn't in any way line up with what a nurse even a year or two out of school can make at the bedside um, working right across the driveway at the UVM Medical Center and I think what I noticed for myself is as I said I've been a nurse 31 years so I'm at the top of the pay scale in Vermont because of my years of experience and as a full-time professor with my doctoral degree at the university which is public information that you can all look up um, I made more at the medical center last year that I work as a per diem nurse, just you know, on call when, when needed. So I make more in the role at the bedside than I ever will, honestly, at the university side. So when you think of a nurse so like Patricia, um, who's already deep in debt, may have an interest in going on with her education, but is she gonna go further into debt to get an advanced degree to teach when in fact the teaching role will pay her far less than what she's paying right now. The economics of it just don't match up. So I meet a lot of nurses in my day-to-day life who wish they could be nurse educators, but there's economically, it, it just doesn't make sense for most of them to pursue that. Where the same amount of education as a graduate degree, two or three years, you could be a nurse practitioner, where again, the numbers are be so much more in the nurse's favor. Um, so it's, I feel like Vermont could really be a trendsetter here. Vermont could really set the, set the example for the rest of the country over how, how we could equalize that out. Like Courtney said about making an incentive for a nurse to go back to school, but also encouraging the, the nursing faculty, you know, to not only be paid what they're worth, but continue that contribution, um, to the profession. And then we could bring more students in. I mean, the cycle perpetuates itself. If I had more nursing professors, I'm sure we would bring in more nursing students. And Vermont, the University of Vermont, and most of our nursing schools in Vermont have really good reputations within the nursing community. If if we had positions for many well qualified applicants, mm-hmm. I think they would come. Yeah. And and so considering that whole that whole cycle really needs to be reevaluated. And I'd love to see Vermont on the forefront. Of, of of setting an example for how we could do that um because that's not just you know that's a nationwide problem not not just for moms right no that sounds like a, an absolute win-win and we haven't given that enough attention i see um that the request has been made to the state to start paying um nursing professors and attract faculty um i kind of want to ask a just a question that's on my mind and and um terry you may know the answer you know there are sometimes discrepancies in terms of um, how much doctors are appreciated versus nurses, and would you say the same issue exists in, um, you know, for for doctors who go back into teaching as as that exists for nurses? Is this a problem across the medical field? 
Oh, oh now <laughs> that's a loaded question. Um, the, it, we're really talking apples and oranges. The whole infrastructure of medical education to becoming a physician and then the their whole tiered system is much better developed. Um, the expectations are much different. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so you're, you really honestly can't compare the two. I will say, and this myself personally speaking, I feel that it's still a very physician centric area that I work in right now. And until we, this goes really more towards the workforce issues, you know, until the, that playing field is a little bit more balanced and nurses really feel like they have a voice in the care of the patients alongside their physician colleagues, some of this disconnect is, is going to continue because I think the respect the, uh, for the physicians, it, it is greater than it is for the nurses. We, we can look no further than the pandemic and all the news coverage and all, every time there's a news story on, you know, a healthcare related issue related to the pandemic, they're pulling out a physician or two or may, to talk about the issue. Seldom do they pull a nurse or we, you know, we clearly, we have a lot to say and, um, and we are at the bedside actually caring for the people during this you know, pandemic and, and every day. But seldom is our opinion, you know, given as much weight as our physician colleagues. Mm. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Christina, I'd love to go to you um, to talk about, uh, it sounds like safe staffing ratios um, for patients and nurses. I know others probably have opinions on that, but I'd love to get your voice in here and then let yeah, others I talk about that as well. Sure. Um, I'd like uh, just to piggyback. I think I can segue in. So I think we need educators. Yes, I agree 100%. We need to incentivize educators. We need more nursing students. But we also need to focus on keeping those nursing students in Vermont. And that's kind of where I'm going to go with my point is that we just don't have enough bodies and we don't have enough skilled bodies. I think anyone on this call can relate to the fact that we are working with very, very green nurses a lot of the time, and many nurses that are not from our own institutions. Those nurses can have amazing, amazing skills, but um, they're not always specific to the units that they're in. We need to figure out how to retain nurses so that, yes, our ratios are adequate to meet our patients' needs. Currently, I feel that almost everywhere I work, we are unable to meet our patients' needs to, to the best of our abilities. As a nurse, we all feel like we need to be doing 110%. We need to be providing the best care, but right now our resources are really limited and we're not able to do that because we don't have the, you know, the, the, the depth in our field of nursing staff on a shift. So you could work in an ICU and have, and, and uh, there are many people on this call who can speak to this, but Often our patients, our patients right now are sick, and we all know this, right? The last 18 months, just the pandemic has exacerbated a problem that has been outstanding, access to mental health, access to primary care. Um, those are things we have, we've had trouble with, and they're far worse now. So when we see that and people aren't getting into those primary care appointments and they're not getting to their, their mental health appointments, they come into the ER sick. They end mm -hmm. up in the ICU far more sick because they needed a heart surgery a month ago and or six months ago really now um and they're getting it late and their prognosis isn't as great and they're requiring higher acuity care and devices and things that we just aren't staffed for right now mm -hmm. and so i think for me getting in new nurses retaining new nurses so that they have the skill and ability to take care of this population that is aging and sick it's the sickest population we have had in a very long time. And you know, to piggyback on that, we don't have the resources outpatient to keep up right now. And so we need, yes, to focus on the hospitals. We need to focus on the primary care clinics. We need to focus on the mental health clinics. I, it's just an all trickle down. And I think until we can effectively retain staff in this state for I mean, all areas of nursing, it's, it's going to only get worse. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very interested in, you know, we talk a lot about, about problems. I'm so interested in solutions if people have ideas, because I think I'm, you know, I've been on these 
think tank calls recently with Senator Sanders, with Peter Welch. We're trying to think of how do we make it better? Um, and I think we just need to, to be those people as we always are, as, right? We're nurses, we're creative. We need to really start pushing and thinking and, and really advocating for our profession because it's, it's drowning. Yeah. Um, and so Christina, I, think I think that that's absolutely 100% on point. And I keep telling myself, what is going to make Vermont marketable? What is going to make it so that people want to come to Vermont and open a practice or become employed at a practice? And I just, I struggle with it myself because in a way I'm like, I'm trying to get out of here, but I want to be here. And I, I just, it's, it's so disheartening when I'm trying to get a client into a, into a primary care office and they're like six months. And I'm like, but wait, this guy is hypertensive, diabetic, six months. I don't know if he's going to make it. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Courtney, you look like you want to say something. It, I mean, and it's such an expensive system. I, you know, I'd say as a lawmaker, we, we know we're also trying to explain to, you know, Vermonters how the costs keep climbing and their, you know, and, and their out-of-pocket costs, their premiums, their deductibles. And, you know, at the same time, we know that you are being understaffed and under-resourced and underpaid. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where we really have to dig in um, to where the, the dollars are going. And I know that folks have thoughts about that as well. Courtney. So I would really just like to talk about, you know, more on the issue. I think one of the things that would, that would really attract nurses to Vermont would be, you know, establishing safe nurse patient ratios. I know this might seem a little counterproductive while, since we're meeting about, you know, staffing crises in nursing, but right now, California is, is the only state in the United States that has established safe nurse patient ratios. And I think that this is critically important, you know, um, to not only increase patient safety, decrease patient mortality, but to really decrease nurse burnout. Um, I read recently that half a million nurses are expected to leave the bedside this year. And this is already compounded on top of all the nurses that have already left the bedside because during the COVID pandemic. And I think if Vermont was to become the second state um, and the only state on the East Coast to establish safe nurse patient ratios, it would, it would attract a lot of nurses across the United States to want to come and work in Vermont because I think they would feel it's safer um, and it's, you know, it would create better working conditions um, and I think it would, again, ultimately be better for the patients too. Um, so that's just, that's just my thoughts on that. Thanks, Courtney. If anybody else wants to say something about nurse burnout, safety in the workplace, violence against nurses, we can sort of talk about that. And then um, Patricia, I see, I see your hand up and then Margaret's hand. So we'll go to questions after everyone's able to give their thoughts on, you know, the climate of, of working as a nurse. I think I'd like to speak to not so much violence in nursing, but I think Keisha, at the beginning, you said so about us, you know, being a very female, female, predominantly female dominated profession. And I, I think what what's intersecting here that um, is kind of the elephant in the room is there's been a real and is an ongoing generational shift. And as someone who's been in nursing for a long time, and I know there's someone else in, in the audience who's been a nurse longer than me, God bless you. Um, and I think what the profession has not done is caught up with what those generational trends um, have meant for a female dominated profession. And that's that women my age and protect older, this, the working conditions were something we endured. It was something to be expected. And it was something that, well, that's the job that you signed up for kind of mentality. And today's younger workforce, sorry, don't mean to label anyone as younger, um, do, they they don't have to put up with it, I guess is the best way to phrase it. They have options, they have choices. 
And, um, and so with their feet, with their resignations, they're not putting up with it. They're seeking other employment. They're leaving nursing altogether after only a few years in the profession because the working conditions are just not sustainable. Um, and what, what I see happening is that our employers, the healthcare system has not caught up with this. And I, I wish I'd see more interest from them in trying to catch up with this. How can you, as Christina said, retain, not only get them here, but retain them so they stay here for a few years um, in the, at the bedside working as nurses? Because if you keep telling them they can't ever take time off and they have three kids, and but oh no, you can't take vacation, we don't have enough people to replace you, that's not, a, that's not something someone of a younger generation than me is going to they're not going to just put up with it for the next 20, 30 years because, oh, well, that's what I signed up for. And this is my community. They're, they're leaving in droves. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's, it's that intersection in that aspect with the, the working conditions are so much more difficult than they are now. I think of Christina working in the ICU and I think I worked in the ICU 25 years ago. It's an unrecognizable environment to me at this point in time. Yet nursing has not caught up with that. We're still staffing it in the same way. The same traditional models of providing this care still, still are in practice. I probably wouldn't recognize a lot of the medications and the treatments, but how the nurses were placed and what they were expected to do day to day probably would look similar, and that shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. They should have evolved that care design in the same way that the medical treatment has changed. Um, but nursing is still here. Hospitals are still here doing the same same things and expecting that someone's going to do something differently. And so that's why many, many nurses are leaving the profession with even just a couple of years experience. Mm. Thanks, Terry. I see a lot of nodding heads, a lot of agreement in the, in the chat as well. So we're going to open it up for folks to share comments and questions. Um, Patricia Pomerlo, I see your hand. Mute. There we go. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Keisha, thank you for for hosting this. Um, I am a nurse. Um, for most of my life, was running hospitals um, and being a di director of nursing, and then being a chief operating officer. And I am um, I am so impressed by the comments from today, uh, the the assessment of what is going on. Uh, I've been away from Vermont for over thirty years. I just moved back. Um, about 18 months ago, uh, sort of quasi-retired. I still own a company, but I no longer work in hospitals. However, I read an article today in the Washington Post that says babysitters are now making $21.50 an hour in New York City. And teachers and nurses in New York City are now taking babysitting jobs. Uh, what I, the reason that I came on the call today um, is first of all, I have a good friend who is uh, in nursing, Rosemary Dale. Uh, she and I were baby directors of nursing together. Um, and, and I am willing to, I would like to assist in helping persuade the legislature to make some very significant changes and, and forward movement relative to nursing. Mm -hmm. And that means um, increased salaries, for nurses, increased salaries for particularly even nurse educators. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous what we pay nurse educators in this in this town. And as Patricia had mentioned, hi, my namesake, um, uh, is uh, forgiveness, because we need to make going into nursing more attractive and less burdensome. Mm -hmm. And I think the burden is as is as significant as the salary. You know, having that incredible burden of nursing education. I have taught in the schools in this state. I am so impressed by the nurses in this state. And I now have time because I am no longer a chief operating officer or working in those, in those roles. I now have time to help. So if you need help to persuade people, I'm pretty good at persuading people. And if you need some assistance, I am more than, than at your service to work with you uh, to make these changes with, and with Bernie too. Bernie is a friend of mine. I can, I can work with you and with Bernie to see what we can do for nurses in this state because I'm back and I'm ready. 
all right, I just felt a force of nature, you know, appear in the state. So, and Patricia, I, I think we have your email from registration if you wanted to share it with any others privately or, it, you know, some somehow in the chat, but I'll leave that up to you. But we'll certainly find you and, and use your voice and capacity and really appreciate that. I'm, I think others will do that as well. Um, before we go to other questions, I did want to note that, um, you know, we have some other legislators who are listening. Uh, Representative Leslie Goldman, who's on the healthcare committee, is, is listening in from Bellows Falls, all the way from Bellows Falls. Um, and uh, Representative Jana Brown is here from Richmond. Um, so just wanted to note others are, are listening. And, and, and Jana's on the education committee, which doesn't always, you know, she may say the same, doesn't always get to touch on continuing education and um, graduate level education, but they may have uh, a hand in this as well. Um, and now, Margaret, I see your hand next. I just want to say, I don't, I just have, I'm probably like one of the newer nurses on here. I've only been a nurse for four years. Um, when I trained, I was trained by these nurses who had been nurses for longer than I've been alive. Um, but they're all gone. They all left. Um, cause they didn't want to go through it. So now four years, um, that's like a lot of the experience. Um, and I just wanted to say how scary it is. Um, and no one wants to stay because like, my job right now, I get the, like the privilege of like, we have charge nurses who have only been nurses for nine months and then they're in charge and, um, and then there's no one really like to look up to them, like to look up to. And then, um, or you go to the ICU and there's no one to train, like train these people on these devices that are specialized that you can't just like put anybody in. So then there's an impella and they're like, who's taking it? And there's no one to train the new staff and there's no one to take it. And these patients are honestly just kind of out of luck. And that's just really unfortunate because we have the technology, we have the capability, and then it just kind of falls short. And um, I'm lucky where I don't have student loans anymore because I went travel nursing or I quite honestly would not be able to afford to live in Vermont. Like, and that's with experience, but like, I know nurses who are simply leaving because like they like you can't live here you can't live on your own so like to do it like I'm 26 and you know I have multiple roommates which is fine and I love them but like that just seems weird to me that like if we want nurses to stay at the bedside and like make a career out of bedside nursing and my mom's done it she's been a nurse her a bedside pediatric nurse her whole life but like for me like it's honestly not feasible to even stay here because I'll never save any money. I'll never be able to do any of that. And I think that's a huge problem. And these young people, they see travel nursing. Heck, I saw it. It got me out of my debt. And then I settled down. But like, unless something drastically changes, we're going to constantly be behind because not everyone like can go travel nursing and stuff. But I just wanted to like emphasize how scary it is and how frustrating it is. Um, for a lot of us who are still at the bedside. Wow, uh, thank you, Margaret. I mean, you really drove home the crisis part of all of this and um, illustrated that in such a, in a frightening way, as you said. Um, I, I, you know, wanna allow panelists the opportunity to respond as well. I also see, you know, Deb Snell has her hand up next, uh, president of the Vermont Federation of Nurses and Healthcare Professionals for AFT, so I know, she has some things that are really important to say as well, but I do see some panelists who really want to jump in. Yeah, so I actually, I, I agree with you 100%, and Deb can speak to this because we work together in the ICU. So I'll tell you how we deal with that right now. We, we don't have experienced staff. A lot of times we sacrifice patient care. So if someone comes out of the operating room with a fresh coronary artery bypass, and we have three nurses out of 12 that, that have the skill and ability to take care of that patient, one of those nurses leaves their assignment and goes and does that for four hours until that patient is stable, until there's a pediatric ICU patient who needs to come in, and there's no skill and ability to take care of that. So then you switch assignments again. And then someone comes out of the cath lab with an impella, and you only have one nurse on who knows how to take care of that patient you switch assignments again. So the patient care is completely getting compromised. And that is something that I feel like our higher ups in our hospital, our legislators 
people do not understand. And it, they are not going to understand it until it impacts them or their family member, but it is truly poor care. And it's not that any of us want to be giving poor care, it's the discontinuant, discontinuation of care is not good for anyone. But we Amen, have, Christina. Amen. We have so <laughs> little depth in our bench. That, and, and what's happening is, and, and Deb can speak to this too, half of our ICU just left because they are so stressed from doing this because the mental anguish of not being able to provide the best care you want to provide because resources have been taken away from you and you have no help is wearing. And so people leave and they go to quality and they go to data and not that these things aren't important, but they leave the bedside. And right now we need bedside nurses mm -hmm. or they go travel because anything's better for five times the amount of money. Right. I, I, but it's not, it's just, we are so thin right now. And if we do not retain the nurses we have to teach the new coming nurses, I fear for who will take care of, of me, our generation. And so that's been something that, you know, it, it's so great to hear a new grad say that because it is true and it, it's only getting worse by the day. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I just like to make a, you know, I would just like to touch on some of the other comments that were made. And I really agree with a lot of what everyone is saying here. I think that, you know, I work right now as a travel nurse and my cousin, um, she is an ER nurse in New Jersey. She just bought a home and she just recently, a couple weeks ago, left her permanent job to become a travel nurse because she could not afford her student loan payments when they start up again in May with her new mortgage that she just had. And it's really sad, you know, when, when we, we're doing such a critical job, we're working and we're, we're treating people during this pandemic, we're seeing so many horrors that we haven't seen, you know, in our careers. And we're having to make a choice between owning a home and paying student loan debt or having to move. Um, and, you know, I think consistency and retention is really important. And I think that, um, that again, going back to student loan forgiveness and doing you know, these different things is, is important. And I think that a lot of the nurses that are leaving to travel, you know, would like to stay home. They would like, they don't want to leave their families. They don't want to leave, you know, their husbands and their kids. And I'm seeing so many nurses that are doing this just because of the crippling debt um, and because of the wages that aren't matching up with and aren't matching up with the housing prices and and whatnot um and i think like christina said it's important you know to have solid you know nurses with experience who will be able to train new nurses who really need you know extended orientations who need three to six months of orientation and it's important that we're able to retain nurses you know um and keep them at the bedside um by having experienced nurses in the hospital can i also just say one thing like i dream of the day where i don't have to walk through my doors and tell my children to wait to give me a hug can i dream of the day where i don't have to walk through my doors and take my clothes off in my uh in the in the in um my like um whatever the like little area in between and and just move forward towards a shower and then like give affection to my children i just i just can't wait for the day where i can just love on my kids when i come in the door it's just like i'm ha i'm on high alert mm. and it's so stressful mm. and as a minority i don't want to be responsible for getting anybody else in my family sick and that's extra baggage that i bring every day to work mm is the patient care that I'm giving to someone else going to affect my family? Mm 
my own family. Mm. And, and that in itself, it's, it's almost traumatizing, mm. you know? I, I just don't know what to do anymore. Mm. It's such a burden to bear, Patricia. I'm so sorry. And it's been a lot of years of doing that and waiting and people, other people are not as patient and are not sacrificing nearly as much. Deb, Deb, you've been waiting really patiently. It's great to see you. Thanks for being here. Yes, and thank you um, for hosting this. Um, I just wanted, there's a couple points I really wanted to make listening to everybody. Um, you know, first of all, all of this stuff is not gonna happen. Nothing's gonna happen unless we keep the people that are here right now here. And there are a number of things we can do that besides raising wages. We really need to look at tax breaks for healthcare professionals, even if it's just for the course of a couple of years till things settle down again, um, because we need to use every tool in the tool belt right now that we have. And I really think that is something that could potentially keep people here. If the governor was willing to pay $10,000 for people to just move to the state, not even work here. He can do this for the people that are here right now. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, we need to attract more people here to the state, including healthcare professionals, because as much as I want Vermont to produce enough nurses to serve our state, it's not gonna happen any time in the near future, unfortunately, not with the number of nurses we need. So to get people here, we need a place for them to live. So we really need to fix the housing crisis because that is part of why nurses are going to travel so they can afford to buy a home in their state, mm -hmm. which is absolutely insane. And as far as like loan forgiveness, forget that. We need free tuition for anyone wanting to go to nursing school right now, period. Any Vermonter wanting to get into a nursing school program should be able to get in. I know the state colleges right now have like hundreds of people on wait lists waiting to get into nursing school. We need to figure out a way to expand the programs, expand the campuses, have provide free tuition for anyone wanting to go there. And to get people into our state, then we can talk about like a loan forgiveness program for them if they work with us and agree to stay for like five years or whatever, enough where they can put down roots in our state. So, I know I'm blathering, but no, I have folks these, taking notes. So. Yeah, no, but these are like the things I'm obviously very passionate about and I've been working with a legislator about. Mm -hmm. I was excited that um, the senator and um, meeting with him and Peter Welch and our governor with a large group of um, hospital representatives and educators on ways to work this out. I know the senator is very, very interested in trying to figure out how Vermont can be like the shining star for how to fix the nursing problems in our state. And I really feel the things I talked about, those are steps that need to be taken to, to get us over the finish line and through this crisis. And it's not going to be a quick fix. I think we all get that we're in this for the long haul, but um, we need to start taking action now or it's just going to get worse, like Christina said. And hi, Christina, it's nice seeing you. <laughs> Not in the ICU. <laughs> oh, that's true. So, you know, somewhere you get to... Seeing our faces. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very rare. We don't see each other smile anymore. No. So, so oh. sad. Oh, yeah. Well, and thank you so much, Deb. You know, obviously, there's a lot of agreement from folks who are on here, and I'm absolutely hearing you. Um, and, you know, it, it, there are ways that the state needs to kick in, but you know, when you look at UVA Medical and the University Foundation, we need to start getting philanthropists to pay for Absolutely. free nursing programs. You know, it's just, we have philanthropy on a number of fronts with, with medical care. And, you know, we need to sound the alarm that, that we, need, um, we need everyone to be pitching in. Uh, absolutely. So thanks. Thanks so much, Deb. But not absolving our responsibility. As no, well. no. As <laughs> oh, trust me. I won't. I'll be. I'll, I'll make sure <laughs> I keep you on the hook. <laughs> exactly. Please do hold our feet to the fire. Thanks so much, Deb. We have time for, for one more comment or question. I did see a couple people put their hands back down. Just, just maybe thought their um, comments were already addressed. But I see Rose. I know you had. I can still see you. And I think there was one other person. Yeah, Rose, go ahead. 
Hi, hey everybody. My name's Rose. Um, great, great get together today. And uh, Deb, I love you. You're such a strong voice for us nurses. Um, I worked with Deb as well as Christina for a while back. I am a nurse. I've been a nurse for 12 years. I started out my career at UVM. I love UVM, but I, 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 I couldn't afford it. You know, I couldn't afford to continue working there. You know, I put in a lot of years. I worked there till 2016 until I said, I, you know, I need to travel. That's where it's at for me right now. And now that I'm doing that, I'm seeing that our wages, like when you spoke earlier about a daycare provider making the same as a life-saving position, you know, um, and, and the weight of our job. I mean, we're all going home, like feeling like beaten. Like, how do we keep up with this? Uh, charge nurses are given full assignments and they're expected to help others. I mean, it's just breaking my heart. And I'm seeing these new nurses come out of school and they're done, like you said earlier, two years. They're like, I can't do this. It's not what I set out for. Um, it's just put such a strain on all of us. And I don't think the compensation is anything comparable to what a nurse is indeed due for the services that we provide and the care. I mean, we hold this community together. We reach out for people, whether we're at work or not. Those in need of help, that's our nature, you know? And it, yeah, it brings tears. And I'd love to be back in Vermont, but I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to be competitive in our wages. And uh, sadly, I've had to do go elsewhere to find that. And I don't want that to be the case, nor do I want it to be for my family. Um, you know, my son's looking at buying a house now. He works at the medical center in a different capacity. He's like, how am I ever going to afford to live in Vermont for my life and buy and not just continually rent? He's 26, you know. So, yeah, um, us nurses, I think, are very strong people, men and women. And uh, we will stick together. And having our voices heard by people such as yourself, Senator, is so helpful. Because I know a lot of people have strong actions. So, yeah. Sorry to cry. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, that's an incredible note to, to wrap this up on just a reminder of what we heard in the beginning people are going into nursing to help to run into the burning building not to run away from these problems um you know and to uh, that selflessness just comes through that people aren't saying i want to fix this just for myself but for my kids and for you know the nurses who come after me and for patients that need better quality care. Um, you know, I don't want to celebrate the selflessness too much because you all are amazing and have done, you know, just more than any human being could be asked to do uh, in your work. And I don't want to say that in a patronizing way. I want to say that to say we owe you a lot more. And uh, this renews my commitment to delivering on that. I know there are other decision makers um, who will renew that commitment. I will share this if it's okay with other legislators who weren't able to be here. And we know this is going to go out on CCTV as well. Um, this has been just incredibly illuminating. And we have one more minute. I'll let, you know, I'll let somebody on the panel have the last word because I think that's only fitting in case anybody wants to say anything. I just want to say that we are stronger together. And when we have come to a consensus and we're all on the same page, change happens. And that's the beautiful thing. And we've got this. And I believe in every single one of you. And I am so proud, even though we do not work in the same department, even though we do not work in the same hospital, I am blessed to be able to say that we are nurse sisters and brothers and that we've got this and that everything will be okay. We will get there someday together. Thank you, Patricia, for taking us out. Thank you all for being here, um, you know, and we will stay in touch as well. Um, so please, you know, keep in touch. This is, as Patricia said, a family, uh, you know, especially among all of you who have been through the fire um, and have come out the other side. So thank you, thank you. And this has been illuminating. I just cannot appreciate all of you enough for taking time out of your really busy lives and days. So thank you. Thank you so much for letting us uh, have a voice. <sighs> yes, thank you. Thank you so much for everything and being able to talk about this. It's so important. And I'm glad you guys are listening to us and letting the front line, the people involved, give you our input. Absolutely. Yeah. It should happen far more often. Thanks so much again. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye now.